what I've got here is a local screen um, with the browser with the book, which I've, I'm loading off the local disk because I've been having problems with the internet lately and just I think it's not going to cause any problems with the actual downloading of packages, but we'll have to see when it comes to that. Uh, and on the right, I've used SSH in this terminal to access the machine that we're building BLFS on. And the reason why I do it this way is because we've got the browser, we can uh, browse, graphical browser, we can copy and paste commands in quite easily. Um, if we did everything on the, on the actual machine itself, because we're limited to a text terminal console, it's quite hard. It is possible we could have installed a text-based browser and GPM, which is a mouse uh, daemon to enable us to copy and paste text from the text base um, browser. It's it's prone to errors. It's very laborious. It means switching between terminals all the time to copy and paste, um, but it is possible. Uh, this way, there's less chance of making a mistake. It's just a nicer environment to use. Um, obviously, if you haven't got a machine, an extra machine, it, you, you would have to resort to doing everything via the text interface. But um, Hopefully you've got an access to another machine, or if you're doing a vir virtual terminal, you could do it this way as well. So what I'm going to do is um, basically build on what we've done so far. So we started off with a very basic uh, Linux from scratch build, as you know, the state of the machine was as it was at the end of the Linux from scratch book. I've added in wget so that we can fetch files from the internet from any of the protocols that are normally used and such as well HTTPS mainly but also it will also work with other protocols um, and also I've installed OpenSSH to allow me to get access to the machine remotely which is what I'm doing here. Um, there's a couple of other tools that I'm going to install immediately which will help if you're on the command line so normally i wouldn't go straight for these but if you are not in the gui environment and you are working on the machine um, i'll just show you these tools as well which can help so the first one which is probably the most beneficial is gpm uh right, if i click on the right terminal and what this is, it's a, um, can I change this to default to zoom all the time? Right, let's see how that goes. Um, let's see if it opens up again. Right, that's actually made that bigger now. Set. Okay, let's see how that goes. The trouble is making the fonts too big is that there's less fits on the screen and there's either wraparound occurs which could cause problems or text goes off the side of the screen so um, for example the terminal I've set this to 80 characters so I can't really make the font any bigger um, and likewise I'll have to just monitor how the browser goes but GPM is like a well it stands for general purpose mouse daemon I think it is uh, yeah general purpose mouse daemon and it allows you to copy and paste basically in um, well, any console, uh, but specifically a virtual console. So it's quite a useful thing to have. It might be even one of the f first things you install after WGET, actually, before even you think 
in think about uh, open SSH uh, you do need some kernel changes to ensure it works so let's do that first uh, check to see if the um, kernel set up for this we can do this quickly actually by doing zcat because I've enabled the option for the kernel to be stored in the virtual file system that the kernel maintains I can actually do uh, this command so that will give me an output of the config that we use to build the running kernel and I can filter that with uh, input mouse dev which is that option there so this option wouldn't appear unless this option was set um, it does say it's not set so it looks like I'm going to have to go into the kernel rebuild the kernel and uh, carry on so let's go into sources Linux make menu config right so this I thought this was set to 80 columns and it's not all right it was 79 it must have moved slightly when I first set this up okay so let's try again you can see why I like to keep 80 columns on the on the screen so we need to go to device drivers input device support which is that one there generic input layer well that's already selected and then look for mouse interface yes it hasn't been set so I'll just press yes there to turn it on and quit that and this is why I say always keep the kernel around because if you need to make some tweaks rather than rebuilding it all the time you can let the kernel decide what it needs to uh, rebuild so I'm just gonna rebuild that now And you can see rather than build the whole lot it's just build a few items the few modules that it needs and uh, it just rebuilds everything together and that's it it's done in 14 seconds so nice and simple so I'll mount the boot because my boot is separate and I'm going to copy the uh, okay that's not in there I'll have to get the let's do Command here all in one go. So is it arch x86 64 boot bz image to the boot and it's the VM Linus and CP system dot map to boot system dot map and copy the config to boot config and make modules install as well and that should be sufficient so the kernel's been updated so what I'll do now is I'll reboot this Uh, reboot and access it again wait for it to reboot okay you can't see the screen but it's just uh it's just got the logo on and the menu so it will be up in a moment and that's it so if I log back in again now as root so now if I recall that command to scan the config file you'll see um, there's a lot more than it was before now it actually does say it's been set so that's all ready to download So I'll fetch that, we've got a patch to fetch as well. Um, 
In fact, before I do that, I'll change into the sources BLFS directory before I download these. Uh, all right, okay, they didn't paste properly because I need to paste that in instead rather than. Use the selection. Okay, that's better. Right, so we've got this warning about the no no check certificate. We'll probably get that. Going to get this on most of these. Um, I'll have to try and remember to use the FTP link if there's one there. It'll be a, bit, a little bit more convenient. So that's the file, the source file downloaded. So let's extract it. Change into it and we can start building. So generally with these, they've lumped all the commands together with these double ampersands, which means you can run them all in at once. And if any one of these fails, then it won't carry on and do the rest of the commands. Um, but it does mean you need to check the end of the output just to see if it has failed or if it's expected to complete uh, as it should should have done. Um, under command explanation, sometimes there's optional switches to add to the configure command or optional things to do. So before you just go copying and pasting it in, it's worth just checking down here to see what's going on. Um, sometimes the uh, options are listed. Sometimes there's optional options that aren't in the command that you might want to add. So it's worth checking. But in this case, there isn't anything. So we can just copy all of this, paste it in and build it. You can see the patches run there. Now Autogen is running and in a minute you'll see the configure run and then finally you'll see all the um, source files being compiled with make and that will become obvious when Autogen is finished. Looks like that was not actually doing anything, which is a bit strange. Oh, that's that is really weird. That seems to have locked up for some reason. Uh, right, let me get another. It's not done anything. Oh, it did come out of that strange how that apparently just locked up. It wouldn't take control. So it looked like it actually did something. I've, I've never seen that before. Normally you can interrupt anything that's running. Uh, okay. Uh, what I'll have to do now, because I'm not sure what state this is in, I'm going to have to uh, tidy this up and rerun it. I might just do the commands one at a time. Um, so I'll tidy up the GPM, extract it again. 
Right, I'll do these commands one at a time. I'm surprised that Autogen behaved like that. I'm not aware that that's ever happened before. Just see how long that takes of interest. Oh, that looks better. That's strange why that didn't output anything before. Okay, so let's do the configure. Can't quite, can't quite explain what happened there. And I certainly hadn't done control S because the console would have warned me if I do control S now. Oh, it hasn't warned me. Interesting. Oh, I didn't know it's selected. If I do control S to stop the output. Oh, no, it's not warning me. Maybe I had done. Oh, the, I am on Debian, so whether, whether Debian's turned that off or not, let's see about setting that. Yeah, maybe that's something that's... I oh, don't know. Certainly on my Gen 2 systems, I'm sure when you um, do Control S to stop the screen, it, it pops up with a warning. So maybe I had pressed Control S, possibly, but I don't know how it released itself. Um, anyway, that's built. So now let's install it. And that's done. So all I need to do is to install some boot scripts to start the daemon. So I need to go back, go into the BLFS boot scripts, which are, are still under the BLFS directory, as you can see there. Make install GPM. I can start the server now. Uh, init GP start. Uh, no, I won't. I'll configure it first. And I'll edit that file now. Uh, generally, these options here work perfectly well. So it's IMPS2 and leave that blank. Uh, there is some information there about setting additional options or alternative hardware if you need to. I'll save that. I'll start the daemon up now. So that started okay. Now you won't be able to see this, but if I move the cursor, yeah, I've got a cursor moving around on the screen and I can highlight sections of the screen. So when I go back to showing you the actual terminal on the computer at some point later on, um, I'll, I'll make a point of mentioning that to show you that that's the GPM working, but it, it certainly 
uh, like I say, if you are working on the terminal, that can be really, really useful. So that's GPM installed. Uh, I might need to start keeping a log of what files I've, uh, sorry, what packages I've installed. So I'm going to just keep a, I won't show this all the time, but I'm going to keep this spreadsheet running in the background uh, and it will have a list of all the packages that I've installed or maybe some notes to tell me what I need to install. So I'll copy that in as the one that's been done. Um, other ones I've already done is wget, which needs a reinstall. So I'll just copy that, paste that in there. And open SSH. So paste, oops. Oh, I pressed enter. Okay. <sighs> right, let's do that again. So reinstall. So I'll just keep that off screen and I'll You'll see me switching over to it, just updating it when I remember. As hopefully I'll remember. So that's that one done. So the next one I'm going to do now is Lynx, which is a text-based web browser. There are two here. Uh, I prefer Lynx, but uh, I have used the other Lynx, KS. Uh, it's perfectly adequate. I just prefer the way that Lynx works. So I'll install that one. In fact, let's have a look at that one as well. Don't, I don't normally install this, but this one has got some dependencies that will need to be put in, and so is this one. So these will probably need to be reinstalled to get the full functionality later on. But for now, if you uh, are on the console, I'll install them both, and you can choose which one you prefer. So copy link address. Where are we now? Fetch the first one, and I might as well fetch the other one while I'm at it. Hopefully, these will compile without any of the additional dependencies for now. Okay, so that second one needs no check certificate because it's HTTPS. The first one was just the normal HTTP, so that's why that worked without that switch. Okay, so let's start with the first links. So I haven't got graphics mode at the moment, but that's something that maybe we could turn on later on when it gets rebuilt. It's done, so let's now install it. And that's done. So if I type links, you can see there's the browser that's worked. Uh, 
g to go to URL. So let's try https colon Let's see if that works right. Do you want to connect anyway? Yes. And there's the Linux from scratch web page. And you can see you can go to the links that are highlighted. Q to quit. Yeah, that's that one. So let's now go on to, or oh, let's copy that. Paste that into the spreadsheet. And go on to links. Oh, okay. And all oh, right, okay, there's a patch there. So let's fetch that. Go back into the source directory, apply the patch, and just check there's no other options we might want to use. So it tells us why it's using sysconfdir, why it's using datadir, why it's using these options, uh, why it's using that one, and the local chart set. Then there's some optional ones here which um, it hasn't put in the configuration which you might want to set so for example I don't use IPv6 so I won't be adding that but this one might be useful so let's copy this command and then I'll add in this option here then run make and that's done so install it with these uh, commands here and it's finished so some information here about configuring links so something here about displaying the current locale character set fix that um, something about a uh, external editor and about cookies not being preserved between sessions so if you want that you can put that in so now if I run well let's tidy up Type in links, uh, sorry, links on its own. It defaults to its home page because I didn't specify a URL. Well, it's trying to. So let's do no. And what I'll do is I'll do. G oh, okay, it drops out. So let's do HTTPS again. Let's get the links one up. I thought I typed it in at the prompt. I didn't. So links HTTPS then it's from scratch.org. So it says the unable to get the certificate. So yes, I do want to continue. And there's the Linux from scratch page. I think this might be why I prefer the links rather than the other links because this one uses color so it highlights various aspects of the web page so it makes it a little bit easier to read. 
um, when you press the down arrow, it moves to each uh, link that's available. So, for example, we go to uh, links from scratch. Again, it warns us that the certificate's not available. Continue, yes. And you can see there's the uh, Linux and Scratch page. So that's that. So armed with those two extra facilities, the or programs, the links, one of the links is, and the GPM, you would be able to carry on doing the installation of BLFS from just the console. If you're at the machine, you didn't have any other way of connecting into that machine as I'm doing here. So I'll add that to my list. I'll rebuild that later at some point. Uh, I should really put in why they need to be reinstalled. Um, this one probably doesn't need a lot more to reinstall it, to be quite honest, but we've got other work to do before then. So we'll carry on with that. So we'll shut that down, quit that. Um, and if you want to download something, you just highlight whatever it is and press D to download it. Uh, after you accept the fact there's no, and then you get this option here to save to the disk. So I just want to quit. So that's the basic setup, the four, four programs, five if you include the other links that I've installed, four basic programs to really get going to start with the actual building of Beyond Linux from scratch. So I'm going to go to the top and just start to work through the manual initially, and then I'm going to start picking things out because there's still some things that we can take the basic Linux from scratch setup into a more advanced basic setup if you like so some information there about beyond Linux from scratch something about the accuracy and so on of course this is such a massive book so many packages in it there's, there's bound to be little errors and niggles and so on who'd want to read it so obviously you want to read it if you want to extend Linux from scratch a bit here about how the manual is organized different sections And then there's some information about BLFS, how it's organized and so on. I'm not going to go through all this. You can take time to read this yourself in your own time. The convention's a bit like the Linux from scratch book of how the manuals, uh, the typefaces that are used, what they mean. Book version, so you can see we're on the latest version 12, which was released uh, about three weeks ago. Mirror sites for downloading can be useful. Um, there's something about uh, downloading source packages, uh, change logs. So what's changed between this this version and the previous? How to get information from mailing lists? Uh, some an editor note. It does say there's some notes there that might be outdated. There's something to bear in mind. How to ask for help and an FAQ. Credits for who's involved in this, all these people. Uh, yeah, how to contact, so it's back to the mailing, mailing lists. So important information, notes on building software. So it recommends building some unprivileged user. Well, at the moment, because the system is so basic, we haven't got that, but we'll be setting up a, an unprivileged user, which is highly advisable. It tells you how to unpack the software. Um, and as it says, you can omit the VPROM. So I, I like to leave it in, although, it, you know, especially if you're over a slow link, it might take a little bit longer or or if your terminal's a little bit slow, it does give you some feedback while it's happening, especially if you've got a larger package, you might just be sitting there and be thinking, wondering what's going on. Um, a lot of modern machines don't have hard disk lights either. The electronic drives, so you're really not aware of what's going on. But by doing V, you'll see things happening on the screen so it's quite quite a good idea to do that there's some examples of how to apply patches and so on but don't need to worry too much about that because uh, the commands for applying the patches are always given how to verify the integrity of the files you should really check each file that you download um, just to make sure it's what it says it is and 
well, if it hadn't downloaded properly, you'd probably find it wouldn't extract correctly. Um, there's a bit here of how to create log files. Uh, I, I have used this occasionally and I always forget about T. T is such a useful utility for uh, redirecting. Well, it's more, it's more than redirecting uh, output. Um, it will basically create a, a fork, if you like, so the the output that you normally expect expect will carry on to where it's meant to go. But you're you're basically tapping into that stream and creating a, a replica stream of the data that's going out. So that can be quite useful. Uh, multiple processes. Yeah, I'm going to do this now because I've already forgotten several times to tell the system to. Oh, this is this is strange. I'm getting a pause every time on that, and I don't know why. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I might have to investigate that. Um, the where was I? Yeah, uh, I will be adding this to the profile so that every time the user logs in, they'll get this as default. But for now. Uh, I'll just set that. I'll have to remember each time if I reboot the machine or anything, I'll need to set that up. And, oh yes, Ninja Jobs. I always forget about this one. I'll have to set that as well. So, um, because I uh, did the optional said in uh, Ninja for LFS, uh, it's worth setting that here as well. We can use the minus J2 against Ninja. Uh, there's some information there about the number of cores and how much memory is available. Um, I can't say that I've seen two and a half gig of memory per thread. Um, certainly two gigabyte is the maximum I've seen, at least two gigabyte, uh, or slightly over that actually. So I would I would definitely go with two and a half gig as a safe uh, limit per thread. So it's something to bear, bear in mind if you do get out of memory errors that maybe you, you're running too many cores for the amount of memory you've got. So you might want to reduce that a little bit. Uh, sometimes you'll need to provide one response. Oh, this is just an example to show you what the yes command does um, rather than pressing enter a load of times. I can't say there's a lot of questions throughout uh, the build. I can't think of any particular package where this is a problem, but uh, if you do find it initially or you come across something, then there's obviously this to, to look at. Uh, there's how to look at logs and so on. Uh, then it's using this yes script to show you how to redirect information. Uh, dependencies, this is quite important. Required means that you won't be able to build the package you're interested in building without getting the required installed first. So that kind of makes sense. Um, and it's saying here that the target package can start to function in many subtle ways and installed configuration file can make the init system cron daemon or bus daemon to run a program automatically um, or it can make a program run from a target patch package in the build system or um, configuration sections of the BLFS book may also run a program from a just compiled package so it says if you're installing a target package without required runtime dependency installed you should install dependency as soon as possible after the installed installation of the target package so uh, it's basically saying that if you install a package without dependencies, you really do need to install those required uh, dependencies as soon as possible. And I'd say the same thing for recommended. Uh, these are packages, as it says here, strongly recommended to be installed. Um, and it says the instructions of the book assume these packages are installed. So you could see recommended as being required from that point of view. Otherwise, you'll see... Um, some of the optional commands where it says to uh, put an option in that disables some of the functionality of the recommended package to allow the, the package to build. Uh, it's not always mentioned though, so you might have to find out what 
what the switch is to turn off that functionality that you're not installing that has been recommended. Um, optional, tend to install that uh, if it's useful, if I deem it to be useful. Not always necessary, but it's down to you and it's down to what the package says as well. Uh, some of the optional features, it does say that are external to the BLFS book, so there won't be any instructions for them. So I tend to not install them unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, generally tend to go for optional, recommended and the required, although it obviously increases the complexity of the build because you've got to resolve the dependencies yourself. Um, but it's certainly worth doing. You'll, you'll end up with A, you're less likely to get a build that will break and B, you're more likely to... Uh, end up with an environment that's more uh, functional in terms of the number of features that are available to you. Uh, you can use most current package sources, but it's probably recommended to stick with the versions that are in the BLFS book. I have done that before, but things can break as they get updated and you spend a lot of time trying to resolve problems. And if you want to do that, to be quite honest, you're better off using the latest version of BLFS from the uh, SVN or Git version. The, the latest release that's there uh, where they keep the latest updates. But again, even that could break uh, because it's not fully tested. There's a bit more there about stripping. Uh, so you probably don't want to do that until the end of the build. Uh, and different build systems, there's things here about optimizing C flags, the XX flags. They in themselves can either slow down the build uh, or slow down the runtime even, or even break it. Uh, so it's probably not a good idea to use them if you're not sure, or if you've never built BLFS before. Uh, some more information here about make and the environment, what CMake needs. Meson tells you how to configure. So this is quite a useful page to come back to if you want to change some of the options. In fact, I think I'm going to bookmark it myself. Uh, speed dial. In fact, what I'm going to do is just go back, keep this index up, because it can be useful to jump into. I'll get that up in a new tab. So yeah, different build systems. Um, some information on optimizing the build, again, using C flags, uh, March setting. Um, yeah, also it says there about ensuring if you're gonna use March, that it does actually support the architecture you've got. Options for hardening the build. So there's information there about turning various switches on for the compiler. There's some information here on the next bit about whether to install and to use or use a local. Um, I'll just take whatever is in the BLFS book. I don't let that worry me too much. Uh, optional pa packages, they may be to fix compilation problems, security problem, broken functionality. I tend to install them unless, unless there's a specific reason mentioned why I wouldn't want to install them in the book. Boot scripts, we've already downloaded this because we've already installed couple of demons, the open SSH and GPM. So that's sitting there all all extracted, ready to be used at any moment, which could be at any time. LibTool archives. So these are things that are created for static libraries which aren't needed and they've got a little script here that will tidy these things up because they can cause problems with the build. Uh, as it says somewhere here. Um, so this script sort of intelligently goes around and deletes the uh, libtool archive files. So all you need to do is just run that. So you should be able to just type it in. And already it's renamed a couple of things that I've installed when I put the uh, UEFI functionality in to get this machine to boot. 
statical shared libraries where well, it goes into some detail about why um, the shared libraries are used in Linux from scratch and not static libraries. Locale related issues, so there's some information there um, about locales that are used. If you get some problems, you might want to come here and get some help. And going beyond Linux from scratch, it gives you information about the structure of the directories that are essential to installing packages. Um, I will be installing one or two packages outside of BLFS that are not even mentioned in BLFS. Um, just to give you an idea and some confidence in going ahead and installing stuff that you want that's not in the BLFS book. In fact, um, somebody on made a comment on my channel that they'd actually installed the Mate desktop environment, uh, which is quite a brave thing to do because I imagine that'd be quite a complicated thing to install. So that's something I think I'd like to look at at some point, but I certainly won't be doing it in this video. So this is the bit I'm going to concentrate on next, which is post configuration and extra software. So there's some configuration still to do just to tune the system, make it a bit nicer to use. And then I'm going to be going through some security things here, basically the certificates, which we need for WGET and a few other packages. Um, just generally a few useful packages, Linux PAM, for example, just to enhance the security a little bit more. Uh, things like sudo, which can be useful as well. So let's go on. Just explains here what these things are about. It says about creating a rescue floppy. Well, as it says there, they've grown quite large today. systems. And it mentions Tom's root boot disk. Um, and version 2.6 of the Linux kernel doesn't allow booting from a floppy anymore. The only trouble with Tom's root boot disk is it's very limited. And also, if you need to do any jiggling around with the X file system, it still uses the older version where um, there was something to do with the number of inodes per block or something or other. It changed, so it wouldn't be able to access any modern um, ext file system. Uh, it just wouldn't recognize them, uh, recognize the feature is not available and vice versa. If you wanted to create a new uh, ext file system, it wouldn't create it with the latest version. Uh, and therefore, that might cause problems in uh, any of the newer packages that can read the ext file system. So that's probably information there just for historical reasons or if you're building older versions, maybe. Um, yeah, if, if you want recovery, I'll just say stick with a CD-ROM or a USB drive as, as you would have done for installing Linux from scratch. Uh, console fonts, well, as you might have seen when I logged onto the actual machine, I'd already changed it. I changed it in the kernel, but the console command resets what you set in the kernel. So if you do want different fonts or different size um, best thing to do is to just enable it or disable it in the console uh, let's edit this with I get some colors uh, to do it here so initially I had that set when I built Linux from scratch um, I then tried that font which I didn't like so rather than uh, messing around with a font I wasn't that happy with I decided to not set a font in the uh, boot up at all and just use the one that I set in the kernel so I just disabled the font setting here um, but you quite uh, it's quite possible to set your own one up and the location is in user share console fonts and these oops 
these are all the fonts that are available in the system so you can use any of these all you need to do is just specify the first part of that uh, file sorry it's that part there I believe um, as it's got here so they're setting GR 737 a-9 by 16 so that's that one there the view so you can see it's everything before the dot psfu dot gz uh, yeah this is the font i actually set in the kernel it says here about um, building the psf fonts uh, but it does produce quite a few font file so uh, that might be something you want to do if you want one of the terminus fonts like i said, I'll just enable mine in the kernel um, which i'll show you where that is and then just uh, disable the linux from scratch setting which overrode it so go to sources linux make menu config oops In library routines and then near the bottom you need to select this option here and then you'll get all these options coming up here and I've selected that one there which is quite a nice big one easy to read on a large screen rather than the tiny fonts you'll get which I think the default is this size here so you can see it's, well, it's double the size so that's quite useful firmware um, don't normally go into this in a lot of details but it's quite a useful chapter to read if you want to install firmware um, okay this has gone quiet again I'm not sure why yeah, so I have to investigate that um, if you do D message and then grep for firmware you'll see everything that's missing firmware. Now, all these are for the wireless, which I haven't set up, so I probably won't bother with that. But something like that's to do with the video. I'm not sure if that is why I'm getting pauses. Um, but there's information here about how to download the firmware and how to install it to get rid of these messages. Um, but I won't be going through that. Like I say, it's not really uh, essential as such. It's um, more a thing as if you need to get get it going uh, for any particular reason. You know, if if the, if the Wi-Fi is not working without the firmware, then you might need to get it going. I have recently done a video about getting Wi-Fi working. I go into detail about identifying the firmware. Uh, and downloading and installing it. So I won't go through that again here, but if you look at that video, um, which is as I say, about uh, identifying and installing the network hardware, that's both wired and wireless, but it, it concentrates more on wireless network. It shows you how to do the firmware in that. Likewise for microcode, if you keep your BIOS up to date with the latest version, then, um, you should find that that should have a fairly recent, if not the most recent microcode update as part of the BIOS. I'm, I'm pretty certain that Dell BIOS updates are regular and they do have the latest firmware in. Uh, I can't say for certain about other manufacturers that I'm pretty sure Dell, Dell are quite uh, up to date when you update the BIOS isn't that, that you'll get the latest microcode. Um, so it goes into information about doing that here. Uh, again, firmware for video cards, all basically different bits of firmware if you need stuff to get things working. Sound systems there as well. How to install firmware, blobs and so on. Some information here about devices, multiple devices and so on. Devices with servers and DVD drives. So I'll go into 
adding or configuring additional user. So this is what we're going to do to create an additional user. So I'm going to create a user now. In fact, do I want to do this now? Uh, Okay, yeah, so it mentions about files used from the ETC scale, but we haven't created that yet. So what I'll do is I'll keep this page up. Once we've created those files, then I'll create the user with this option. And we can see that that option works and pulls the files in from the scale, which is like a default set of files for installation. About system users and groups, there's some information there about the groups that are reserved for use. Bash shell startup files. So first of all, there's a profile it's going to give us here. Now this will overwrite the existing profile, which currently has got the language setting in it. So what I'm going to do is take a copy of that so that I can refer to that and copy that back in where it's needed in, in the new location. So we'll copy this here, paste that in. Don't worry about the formatting going wrong. It will have, will have actually entered in correctly. We can just check that for sure. So you can see that all looks quite normal. I'll create a profile.d directory. And a bash completion script. Uh, there is a note there about some people don't like this. So obviously if you're one of those people, you won't want to copy and paste this. For bash completion, make sure that the directory exists. Now here's the bit where I said that the copying and pasting over wraps and this is where problems can occur so I'm going to change the font and reduce it a little bit yeah even that's going outside the box but yeah that's gone outside there as well so I'm going to reduce it a little bit more I don't want to accidentally miss stuff and cause problems with the build so apologies if it makes it a little bit more difficult for you yeah, that's just about in now. There's no scroll bar at the bottom. So I'll paste that in. So dircolors.sh for setting up the colors. Some extra paths which can be used for packages later on. Read line configuration. UMask set up internationalization. So this is where we need to set up the language setting that we overrode previously. So I'm just going to copy my setting that I had there, which I took a copy of and finally finish that off like that. So I'll just double check that I edited that. Okay. Make sure it looks okay. It does. Default bash RC. And I'm going to edit that now. Uh, let's just check the settings I've got for make, fire, make flags, sorry, and ninja flags, uh, ninja jobs, sorry, so. Make flags. I shall see. I'll go to the bottom of this and just add it in here. So export make flags equals minus J sixteen and export ninja jobs equals minus 
J16. Oh, no, it looks like that's just, it's just 16, is it? Presume that's correct. Uh, let's just search a word for that. This internet's playing up again, I think. Right, yeah, it's okay. Um, yeah, that, that's what confused me. Is make flags, you set the minus J32 as you do with make, but when you export Ninja jobs, it's just the number of cores, whereas you run Ninja with minus J32 as you would do with make. So that's what I wanted to check. So Ninja jobs... That needs to be set to just 16. So that's fine. So now we're going to create the bash profile. Uh, some of these we need to copy to the SKEL directory. So tell us to actually create it here I don't think it does does it so I'm just going to go back here so at the moment let's see if there is a scale directory no there isn't so let's make that and now let's copy dot bash profile. Have I not created this one? Oh, where am I? In Linux. Okay, cp dot bash profile slash etc slash scale. Now a dot profile. And we'll copy that as well. So etc scale. dot 
bash RC. dot log out dot bash log out into scale as well so in the etc scale we've got four hidden files that will be copied to every user if the dash m command is used so now let's create some directory colors Go back to adding user, and now let's add a user. Uh, so we can see here, create the home. Is the option we're going to supply. And Check any other options we might want to use. No, that should be it. So, user add, I'm going to create one called kernel text. Set the password, otherwise, you won't be able to log in. that's done so if I now look at the home directory there's a kernel text home directory and if I look inside that directory list all the files you can see those files from scale have been copied in so for every single user that will get copied in if you specify the M command and they can be edited by each user to customize their own login so I'll get rid of that page now I'm done with it. Move on to Vim. So there's a slightly expanded .vimrc that you can put in home directory to provide user specific effort effects. So at the moment we've got a vim rc there and this is saying to create a dot vim rc oh let me check my location yep so if i copy this in here Uh, in fact, I'll turn that off because I don't like having that one set. And then if I copy dot vimrc into etc scale, that means that will get copied in as well. Now, because it has been copied with kernel text because we've already copied it, I'm going to have to copy that into home kernel text. and then change the ownership because it's currently set to root. That's better. So if I do a VI now, let's do it on dot vim. Oh, okay. I've done that wrong. That should be a quote, shouldn't it? A double quote. So I'm going to have to edit all of these files now. Okay, 
so you've seen that the vi is working anyway so that's okay um let's just check once again the permissions on kernel text all the files in there that's all okay so now what I want to do is come out of this and connect directly as myself to the machine. Log in with my new password. And there I am, I've logged in. It's green to show that I'm the, uh, or sorry, a ordinary user. So if I go to SU minus, type in root password, you can see the prompt turns red to show that I'm a privileged user now. And I'll carry on with the customization. So ETC issue. This is a file that you can um, edit to insert various functions that get displayed when you're on a, a real terminal. They don't show up on a remote console. Um, so I used to use this because I used to use the real terminal quite a lot. Um, but it's probably not worth doing now. Um, Basically, you insert a backslash in front of one of these letters and it will insert that information in place of the backslash and the letter. That's how that works inside the ETC issue file. So, for example, if I edited it, uh, right, I've got something wrong with my network here because this has gone, just jammed up. Oh yeah, it's dropped out. That's strange. Looks like it's an internal issue. Um, right, so yeah, if I try and do that VI, uh, in fact, I won't be able to save this, will I? No. I'll have to become root. Let's try that again. VI ETC issue. So basically, if for example, I wanted to put the system name and the name of the operating system, I put in something like welcome to backslash S. And what that would put in is a little message on the login screen saying welcome to and then the system name and the operating system. So that's how simple that is. Random number generation. So we need to go to the BLFS boot scripts. So sources, BLFS, BLFS boot scripts. And we just run this in here. And we can start that off. So that's a random number generator to carry the entropy pool across each reboot. So that really is all the configuration that we need to do. So what I'm going to do now is to log out, log back in again as the root, and just reboot this to make sure it boots up correctly and everything's as it is as is expected. So reboot. And log out. So obviously, again, you can't see this, but what I'm hoping will happen when I log in again is that everything will be there as as it has been when we've logged in now, just to make sure that the everything works on the reboot. Okay, so there's the grub menu. Just wait for it to boot up. And it's there, so I'm going to connect as myself. I've typed the password incorrectly. Yep, and then change to the root user. And yep, that's all fine. 
So the next video, what we're going to do is start installing some of the security related packages such as PAM and some certificates and so on.